But yeah, no, I lost my passport in Ibiza. So I had to go and get a rushed <laughs> one yesterday. And it's only going to come. So are we recording, Danny? We're recording. He lost it at DC 10. I did lose it at DC 10. <laughs> I lost it at Ushuaia. No, I am. Um, it's, it's actually oh, it's so annoying. So I hired a car with the kids to go and have like a trip around the island. And I put my uh, passport in the glove box and then re- put the car into the valet to park at the hotel. And in the morning, I was like, shit, where's my passport? I was like, oh, it's in the car. So I went to the car, uh, I got the car back and it wasn't there. I was like, oh, oh, where did I? You know when you're like, oh, where did I leave it? So you start tracking your day. It's like, did yeah. I leave it at the restaurant? So I phoned the restaurant. Did I leave it at Cafe Del Mar? Called them. Nobody there. And I was like, crap, well, I, I've got to fly in 24 hours. So I was like, well, I just cancelled it. Uh, booked a new one at the consulate. Um, and, uh, the next day picked up my temporary passport and then I get a phone call from the hotel said, Oh, have you lost your passport? And I was like, uh, yeah, they're like, Oh, it's here at reception. I was like, okay, how did you get it? And they're like, Oh, we don't know. I was like, how do you not know how you got it? <laughs> uh, how do you get my passport and then call me a day later? Mm. Uh, and they're like, do you want it? I was like, no, <laughs> it's no use. Can you shred it? And so now, then I had to fly back. I landed at midnight. I had to go down to Tesco's at one in the morning and get photos done. Wake my accountant up to get them <laughs> countersigned. I don't know if you have to do that where you are. You have to have, but here you have to have your photos. There. You have to have like a person of standing in the community say, I certify this is a true likeness of Peter McCormack. Yeah. And then I had to get up at six in the morning to drive to Peterborough, which is an hour away, to have mm. the appointment. And then the passport should take a week. So it should be here next Saturday. And so I can't fly to Riga on the Friday. So if it comes on the Saturday, I can only get the late flight to Riga to be there on the Sunday to then fly to Australia on the Monday. <laughs> oh, that's tough, man. That's tough. It's a good, uh, it's a good high signal conference. But uh, as I said, I won't be there either this year and uh, disappointed. But uh, everybody that will be there will thoroughly enjoy it. But I'm a little bit worried about your delayed finding of that passport at the hotel uh people you know it's trading hands yeah no so i was like that's so as my, my son was like in fairness he was saying dad did you like drop it from the car to the thing i said like, no I, I knew i'd left it in the glove box i think the valet has parked it because what happens with the car hires people don't usually want them in the morning so i think he's done a sweep found it and handed it into reception they've not they've not called it in but i was like oh that's... What you need to know, Matthew, is it's, it's never Peter's fault. <laughs> it is never my fault. I, I never lose anything anyway, so I wouldn't know how. You, you got to work it out that way, man. I mean, it's good, for the, it's good for the psyche, right? Just to keep, keep trucking forward. And... Speak, speaking <laughs> of conferences, uh, we've confer- kind of confirmed the date of ours. We, I've got to speak to the venue on Monday, but it's going to be... April the 12th in Bedford. Uh, I think it's going to be called... Should, should we say what we think you think it's going to be called? Is that bad, Daddy, just to be on the show? Saying, we think it might be called this. Yeah, no, say it. So we think it's going to be called Cheat Code. And we think it's going to be April the 12th in Bedford. Full-day conference. I can... Can I say anyone's confirmed? Should we hold that back, Danny? And I think we hold that back for now. We've got some good guests confirmed, though. What about football matches? Do they overlap? Yeah, there's a football match. So, yeah, so what we're doing is party Thursday, Friday full day conference, and the second day of the conference, rather a conference, is going to be like a barbecue, a football match, and then a pub. And uh, obviously, Mr. Matthew Mashinsky, we would absolutely love it if you'll join us in Bedford and speak at our conference and come for the football. Oh, excellent. I love it, man. Confirms, yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, so we... Um, we did one last year. We, we timed it for our last home game. We had 150 people come to Bedford. We had, um, who did we have there? We had um, Jeff Booth and James Lavish and Lawrence Lepard. It worked really well. And so we kind of want to do the same again next year, but expand it. More people, more football, more beer. Well, I have yet to see a match, and that was on the bucket list for sure. So, 
Well, it'll be interesting. Look, if it's a good season for us, then it'll be an important game. It could be a title decider or a title winning one. Yeah, it's right at the end of the season. So uh, it's our, it'll be our last home game. So fingers crossed. Uh, but it'd be great to have you. I mean, you've been over to Bedford, but to have you over some football and... But also on the conference side, like we're, we're trying to, we want to do things a bit different. Like I've, I've been to a lot of conferences now and they are, there's no, dis, I can't discredit any of them. Prague was brilliant. Riga's always brilliant. Uh, Miami was brilliant, but but they're, they're kind of all the s- similar. It's kind of like a lot mm. of the same people, same conversations. So we're, we're going to just try and do something a little bit different. Uh, not, we don't want Bitcoin in the name on purpose. Uh, we mm. don't want like a big room of sponsored booths and stuff like that bullshit. We want to be, you know, it's like the conference, right? I think the conferences are really about meeting up with your friends and having a good time. Yeah. yeah. And then like introducing people in. So we just want to make it just more of that and less of the corporate shit. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great idea. And uh, you're taking the town to new heights. So uh, I'd, I'd love to be a part of it. Well, we might have the mayor of Bedford there as well. Fingers crossed. So, but it'd be great to have you there, dude. I'd love to have you there. But put him down, Danny. Sign him up. Thank you, Matthew Michins. Perfect. Yeah. You're in. We'll teach love the people it. of Bedford about base money. There you go. That's what we're going to talk about today. I hope yeah, the man. listeners are ready and viewers. Should have said this before. It'd be better if you could watch. Better if you could watch this one on the YouTube feed, or uh, I don't know if you guys are putting the uh, Spotify video feeds out yet. Not yet, but it's on our list. We're going to yeah. be doing that. Yeah, that's uh, that's a nice thing. Still, it's funny. Like I've been doing it too, and still, most of the like for you know for some of these videos that are better with, there's still you know that you can still learn a lot from the audio content, but it's just better if you follow along with video. And it's still like the majority are on Apple Podcasts. It's pretty funny, uh, mm. even though the Spotify video feed comes out. We've had it before with like Root and Preston, where people have got slides and. Some people go afterwards and they go into the show notes and go and watch it afterwards. Uh, some seem to just get through without seeing them. I think always the best thing is just to try and explain the chart anyway. Yeah. And uh, and if I think you you skip something, I'll like I put my hand up and say, Matthew, explain that again. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I guess we've got questions, but you've I think you've probably got. It sounds like you got stuff you want to just talk about, and dive right into. Yeah. Wait. I I, I told Danny we. Got some charts locked and loaded. I think we can pivot around those for this episode and uh, keep it keep it simple. So um, it's a good old base money to start. Well, you are the base money king. Um, just we always get new listeners, or some haven't maybe heard you before. Just do the uh, TLDR on base money, and then we'll get into it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you know, it's all about comparison, right? And that's what we're all trying to figure out what Bitcoin is going to compare to in the world. You can compare it to stocks, real estate, golf courses, whatever you want. The valuation of Bitcoin is uh, it's $500 billion equivalent right now. But what does that really mean? Uh, it's actually been uh, six years, six full years that I've been doing these uh, reports on, um, on uh, well, five full years, I should say, on the uh, basic money of uh, the world. And when I say basic money, there's a, that's actually a term, economic term, uh, base money, monetary base. And so that is actually the central bank money. That's the money that central banks print. And since they have the monopoly on the money, Bitcoin is about money. If you want to try to get the most apples to apples comparison in the fiat world, it's going to be that. And I can answer many more questions about how a bank deposit uh, you know, filters in there. Actually, I wanted to ask you, Peter, because you remember our show from April, you said you were going to rewatch it because we had so many valuable terms and things we discussed. I, I assume you rewatched it. Matthew, I don't remember last week. <laughs> <laughs> I've just been to Ibiza. Fair enough. Well, this is why days. we... <laughs> hey, well, this, <laughs> this is why we do this, right? This is why we do these updates. So it's yeah. good to refresh. It's for me. It's not for anybody else. Yeah. So, so this is uh, this is actually a survey of all. Set that I have the top fifty central banks in the world, and I'm kind of proud of this because you won't see this in you know you look at an IMF report, BIS, Bank for International Settlements, uh, all these international institutions. They just don't do it, whether they don't want to show you or don't know how or haven't done it. Uh, the survey, I, I don't know, but um, but we've done it here, and what you're looking at here is basically a fifty year uh, chart. Uh, 
as is typical with a lot of things in the economy, stocks, whatever, it's like pretty, pretty calm uh, throughout the first few decades. And then in the, uh, especially after the global financial crisis, things kind of go haywire, uh, rise very quickly. So this is the total base money. And you see after the COVID, well, actually when I started to do these, right, the base money in the world was about $20 trillion equivalent, $20 trillion. And COVID pumped in another 10. So you see that, that bump here. Uh, the COVID stimulus took it to about 30 and a half trillion by, you know, end of 2021, start of 2022. And then as has been these interest rate hikes, um, you know, as they always say, trying to get back to a normal sort of type, uh, type of economy, normalizing the economy, uh, raising these interest rates and things like the SVB collapse and a lot of these banking collapses earlier this year, you will see a drop in the liquidity that the, the monetary base that central banks print and, and uh, as a result of that, and that's what you're seeing. And in fact, this is not a result. This is the main motor. This is like the transition uh, transmission mechanism. This is the main engine of why you would have higher rates, so on and so forth. So you see a big drop and they've cut out as of uh, June. So this is a quarterly update here. As of June, uh, they took out about 3 trillion from that COVID high. So you see 27 and a half trillion. How do they take that out? Equivalent. Uh, by keystrokes, by computer, uh, computer strokes, really. That's, uh, that's how it works. Everything is digital. Um, there is a physical cash component, I should be very clear. And we will talk about that. I got a chart about that. You know, everybody likes to talk about CBDC, but I always remind people CBPC, central bank physical currency, is an important component. So uh, of this roughly 30 trillion, 20 trillion is uh, digital. That's what's called the bank reserves. We'll talk about it. And 10 trillion or 9 trillion actually is, the, is that physical cash, that cash money that you, most of us actually know and love because it's the best way to buy Bitcoin. Uh, you know, sterling, bucks, uh, dollars, euros, yen, you know, the, the coins, the notes, the physical cash that central banks have monopolized. It didn't always used to be that way in the past. You'd have free banking systems without central banks. You'd have private banks issuing notes, but they have... Uh, over the last hundred years, specifically taken over all of the issuance of those physical notes. So basically a third of this number that you're seeing is physical and two thirds is digital. And the big swings, like the biggest swing here is a reduction in the bank reserve portion or the digital portion of uh, banks balance sheets. Does that matter? Like, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, so uh, it definitely matters. Uh, it, it actually, the act of this reduction causes interest rates to rise. So, you know, over the last two years, we've had a gradual increase of interest rates uh, all around the world. That's what's caused those banking crises, the people that were unprepared, you know, revaluation of their bond portfolio, so on and so forth. Uh, that is all caused at the core by this amount. Okay. And it might not seem a big amount because you can hear numbers like, you know, global equities are 300 trillion and real estate is more, whatever it might be, massive amounts of global equity is probably less than that, maybe hundred trillion, something like that, but uh, massive amounts of liquidity. And here you only see a number like 30 trillion, but this is the core. This is absolutely the core of the systems just because uh, these are the institutions, the central banks that, uh, that have the monopoly. They're in charge of the money. So when they remove something like $3 trillion and actually removed a little bit more, you see they were on track to remove three and a half three and a half trillion here at the end of 2022. And then when that uh, interesting, the SVB collapse happened at the start of this year, uh, they pumped a little bit back in, but that's not all, remember this is worldwide. This is not just the Fed. So it's not all related to that, but um, so now they removed about three trillion. So it definitely matters. And so when you see things like rising interest rates, all right, you need to first think that, or, or understand that that's, it's not like they put into a computer, we want interest rates to be that. What they're doing actually, is that they are shrinking their own balance sheet, the balance sheet of the central bank, and thus all the other banks that are connected to them, underneath them, also have to shrink their balance sheet all around the world. So it's a, it's a coordinated effort. But why, why shrink the balance sheet if that means interest rates will go up? Is it just to stem inflation? Primarily. Primarily, so that, yeah. So to stem inflation, they first shrink the balance sheet to require the increase in the interest rate? 
which actually causes the increase in the, yeah. in the interest rate because they are actually they're actually selling the bonds that they owned. They're removing them uh, from from their own balance sheet. We don't have to go through the technicalities of that, but basically, mm -hmm. uh, they are removing what's called the bank reserve liquidity. And so, if they are removing the bank reserve liquidity from those banks, uh, banks cannot make as many loans. Credit becomes more scarce, more valuable, uh, and interest rates go up. So it's a it's it it is literally a uh, sort of action and then response. And the action, the thing that causes the interest rates to go up, that's a very important thing, is this reduction in a bank reserves. And this is just how the system works. You know, uh, I like to ask the questions you're asking as well of my uh, podcast guests, you know, explain some of the more intricacies. But, you know, I've studied this a long time and no matter what they say, quarter to quarter, month to month, or week to week in different, different meetings around the world, uh, they're always printing. And we'll learn some of that actually today when I go through some of these charts. They're always printing overall. It's just a question of are they printing a little bit more or a little bit less? Uh, and I think that's the, that's the key, a key thing. Um, but I'll, okay. but we can we can go forward here. Yeah, sorry. Go well, ahead. Well, I'm, I'm going to end up jumping around a bit because just things come to mind, uh, and th like this might yep. be quite the leap. But I will like get you to bring it back to where you're going with this. But you, you're following what's happening in Argentina, right? Yeah. Yeah. So Millet, the kind the libertarian candidate who is now the l l like the front runner in the elections. You know, he's yeah uh, in the primaries. He I think he surprised because I was out there. A lot of people thought, no, he wouldn't have the legs for it. He's only managed to capture like some of the youth, but he's a front runner. He's the favorite to win the elections now. One of his, you know, key mandates is he wants to end their central bank, which, you know, you know, it's quite it's quite a thing to actually do. I mean, we've heard people talk about Ron Paul's mm. talked about ending the Fed. A lot of libertarians talk about you know ending central banks and you know. Uh, God knows how you do it and the process of wind, unwinding a, a central bank. Uh, a lot of your work is indirectly or directly, yeah. you might say, very critical of central banks. But do you think about uh, ending these kind of central banks? Do you think how a country would, could, what it would mean? Yeah, I, I certainly wish him luck in that endeavor. <laughs> But that's all I would say there. I wish him luck, and I, I, I wouldn't want to be the one doing it. I think it would be very difficult. Uh, and again, I'm not defending the existence of them, but there are so many things leveraged to these institutions. I mean, it's the whole economy, basically. So it's a full reset of the economy. You know, Murray Rothbard, uh, uh, economist, hardcore Austrian economist that a lot of uh, Austrians like, um, he said in the early 90s, uh, there was actually a bunch of uh, economists from my part of the world, Lithuania, free market economists were going around the U.S. and trying to figure out what to do after the collapse of the Soviet Union. They were, you know, that, that was a pretty interesting time because we we're relatively decent sized economies that were starting from scratch, like completely white sheet of paper ending from the communist system. What were we going to do? And uh, he, there's actually a video of him on YouTube where he says, well, these Lithuanians are coming around and they're not going to have a central bank. We, we convinced them not to have a central bank. And it's a great message. It's a great view. But at the end of the day, the Lithuanians ended up establishing a central bank because I am sure, you know, I don't know, but I'm sure in the background, all the international institutions that say, you know, corral around them, say, okay, if you want to be a part of this, if you want to do this trade, that trade, if you want to, uh, you know, maybe get this little support here, you got to have this institution. And so they did, you know, it definitely is a global, uh, it's a globalized systemic thing right now. So if you are a country like El Salvador, who uh, wants to, you know, sort of uh, make waves or a country uh, like Argentina in this case, which has just had so many problems, like they've gone through five or six currencies in the last 50 years alone, um, just like Brazil. I wish them luck, but I find it uh, very difficult in the, it, just the way that the system is so, uh, it's just so, it is global. It actually is global and they really do push you. Now, there's plenty of things that how that could change, you know, this multipolar world and maybe they'd get closer to other countries that are a little bit larger, you know, this BRICS country, so on and so forth. Well, but, I think I think one of the ways they, they will do it, yeah. they've talked about is dollarizing. So they don't have an Argentinian central bank, but they will still be holding to the, the Fed. Yeah. And it's like, you know, 
Is that going to be so much better? There are a lot of people that really think that is the way to go, that uh, just go on a dollar standard. But as we know, uh, at the end of the day, even our uh, very prescient Federal Reserve central bankers are still, you know, just a group of people that are trying to plan an economy, which is just unplanable, as, uh, as Frieda Kreik has always said, and as I'm a big fan of. So I am not, uh, I am not holding my breath when someone says that they're going to do something like that. Uh, yeah, in Argentina's case, if they could dollarize, maybe it's uh, something a little bit different, but it's a huge economy. And if they're going to dollarize and just hinge their hopes on, again, the Federal Reserve, I think you're, you're probably going to have problems at home as well. Like, you know, we got to worry about our pension funds and what happens if U.S. inflation doesn't match our inflation, so on and so forth. So it's a it's a very difficult thing to uh, to change the establishment like that. And that's why I think, as also Friedrich Hayek says, you know, we do it in that roundabout way which is uh, why we, we like Bitcoin so much. So I don't know if it's, if it's uh, you know, these are such, you know, in, illuminating statements for you, but that's, that's generally what I've seen. I, I don't think this stuff is going to change without a big outside catalyst, which is usually how things change anyway, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe ending central banks is through uh, the option to exit via Bitcoin. I think so. And I mean, if if the next best thing is what Argentina is doing, like, first of all, I don't think that like the global central banking elite would would agree with this. But if it's like, OK, you can end your bank, but just dollarize. I don't think that's you know, that's going to be good for the dollar, but you're going to have a lot of local blowback at some point as well. So I don't I don't necessarily see that route as anything promising. Hmm. OK. All right. I like, sorry to interrupt. I'll let you carry on. No, no, at any time. I mean, this is this is all fun for me. So, so we have this big line. Basically, uh, you know, you're under 200 billion, 150 billion, 50 years ago, and it's true. Uh, not all of the central banks. I have data back then, and I, and uh, that's all accounted for in the growth rates and everything. It's it's not like I'm, uh, you know, it's all accounted for. But the regardless, the trend is there. We have something like 200 billion, 150 billion, 50 years ago. Now. Uh, 27 trillion. It's it's still a big number, and like I said, we're still seven trillion higher than we were in January 2020. So so they're always printing, all right? They're always printing at the end of the day. But if you want to see the makeup of this, I'll just build it out for you. So we have British pounds. Mm -hmm. This is a uh, little less than five percent, and then the next big four, uh, we have the Japanese uh, yen in red. There, it's about 20 percent. Chinese yuan, 20 percent. The euro, another 20%, and the dollar, another 20%, roughly, give or take. Um, and then the last, a little bit less than 20% each, if you looked at all of them, because the last, I guess it's 18% or so, whoops, is right there, the rest of the world. So the rest of the world in that light blue, it's only about 18% of the pie. So 82, 83% is the top five currencies. So you can really see how this Pareto distribution uh, works when it comes to this stuff. And the Argentinian peso, yes. Even using black market rates, in fact, when I get, because these are, you got to put all this stuff in dollars, right? So this is all in dollars. Even using black market rates uh, is included in that light blue. So yeah, there's a lot of worthless currencies, even in the top 50. And uh, when it comes to like, really the size of currencies that would move markets, it's the dollar, euro, yen, yuan, and then the British pound is a very distant fifth. Hey, we'll uh, take it. And that's how it looks. Yeah, but you're in the top five. Yeah, we're happy in the top five. Uh, the correlation, mm. uh, is it a case of the dollar moves and everyone follows, or is it a case of uh, global markets are just so correlated themselves that everything's correlated because of that? Or is it a case of, yeah, everyone's looking at each other and when someone uh, reacts, everyone reacts? Why is everything so correlated? Yeah, I think it's actually more the, the last example that you said. It's kind of like when someone reacts, particularly the dollar, everyone reacts. I wouldn't necessarily say it's the dollar driving everything, right? I mean, obviously, China's been a story for 20 years. And yes, they're a very, you know, they have a lot of trade in dollars and they have a lot of assets in dollars, but they have a lot, also a lot of assets in euros and yen on the Chinese balance sheet. Uh, so, you know, it's an interesting question, but I would say, of course, and this is the question that's like obviously coming up with, you know, the Ukraine war and many things. It's like, are we moving into a multipolar world? You know, maybe. Um, but I, I would say it's more of like 
there is some reaction here from a big player, and then usually everybody else follows. But you don't really see, uh, you know, other than maybe Switzerland sometimes or some countries, you don't really see people move in a different direction than, than what's happening here, right? I mean, just look at COVID. Like, everybody increased. It wasn't just the dollar, even though the dollar did a big jump, right? In the monetary base, it was something like three, uh, three and a half, right? Before COVID. And then at the top, the monetary base went up to six. So almost double, in fact. Um, you know, everybody else was increasing as well. So that's it. So that, so the point is, this is, uh, you know, if you look at this, yes, you can, you know, I love the memes about, you know, infinity over 21 million, all those things about Bitcoin. But, you know, even if you want to compare Bitcoin to a stock or to a bond or to uh, real estate, you got to understand that that's just, that's just a relative comparison of value. It's not a native uh, like for like monetary uh, unit. That is actually what we're looking at here. This is really the core of the monetary system. Uh, I'm happy to present this to you and, and I do it every quarter as well uh, on my website and things just because, you know, no one, no one seems to talk about it. No one reports on it. I think it's very interesting, but this is, you know, whether they want to tell us or not, this is like the core of the system and this is the value. And so if you want to know where Bitcoin stands, uh, actually in ranking, of these 50 currencies, it is number eight. It's number eight, which is pretty wild. Okay, you only have uh, the Swiss franc and the Indian rupee after after that. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, no, that's right. No, I counted right, so it's number eight. Bitcoin is number eight, uh, and, which is pretty wild. It kind of looks like a Ponzi. It's clucking like a Ponzi. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it's just a legalized system of, uh, of money that they've, they've, uh, kind of corralled everybody to be on. And like I said, you know, Murray Rothbard was talking about Lithuanians not having a central bank 30 years ago. It didn't happen. Let's see with Argentina. I'm not holding my breath. Uh, it's a very, very powerful scheme. And even, you know, whether you're a socialist country, communist country or capitalist country, everybody is operating on that. Um, I always talk about free banking as well. We don't have to do the big tirade. We did a big, uh, a big uh, sidebar on that, which I like that discussion. A lot of people liked it uh, mm. last time, last April. But it's important to know as well that there are many monetary systems in the past that did not have this. Okay, so you know, Scotland, Canada, Sweden, uh, some more relatively famous examples, but really all around the world. Like even in China, there were there were parts of the world that was kind of like more developed economies, and. Uh, they didn't have central banks. And of course, a really modern central bank really only occurred, the Bank of England was really the first modern one. The Swedes had the first one, but the Bank of England's first modern one, in like the 1600s. And, um, you know, from there, it just, it just grew. So we had a very, you know, Bitcoin-like, decentralized, uh, global trade, global economy. Um, but basically, it's just... Uh, even a free banking system has lost out to uh, to this sort of centralized. Um, you know, I could use words like cartel or cabal. I try to use them not to be too bombastic there, but it's just a centralized system that we live under. And you know, we have to do it. We have to pay our taxes. We have to have our passports, uh, like you said, to go places. This is just how they do it. But the only escape hatch there, as far as I can tell, is like gold, silver, or or Bitcoin. And uh, Bitcoin is a much uh, as we know, a much better way to transact than those other uh, other units. But there's no other way. There's no other way if you want to talk about, you know, getting out of this kind of a system. Well, you say a cartel, historical, is a coalition or a cooperative arrangement between political parties intended to promote a mutual interest. I think, uh, yeah. I don't think you're uh, being hyperbolic saying cartel. It is a cartel because... They take from us within well, they take from one hand with the taxation, and they take from the other hand with inflation. And I, I think it was debunked that uh, Lenin said it, but wasn't it the the way to crush the bourgeoisie is to grind them between the millstone of taxation and, and inflation? I don't, I don't think he actually yeah. did say it. They like attribute it to him, but I think that's actually the place we are in right now. Like I know in the UK they cannot raise taxes any higher. 
They're struggling. They, they're doing it in mm. weird fucking ways. Like we've got this ultra low emission zone in the UK where they're tracking your car. And if you've got the wrong type of car, you have to pay like a, a levy to drive your car around London, uh, which by the way is quite interesting. Most of those cameras are getting uh, destroyed by people in the public, but they can't go wow. out. Yeah. They've raised corporation tax now again. So that's gone up. They can't really raise income tax. So they, they're screwed on the tax side. Uh, but now they're hitting us with inflation. And so we are, we have people trapped in that very confined space between taxation and inflation. It's crushing the middle class. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And, um, you know, the it's true of all quotes, by the way. There's a lot of quotes get attributed to people that uh, that they didn't actually say. I've learned that. Um, actually, I do a lot of, put a lot of quotes in some of these videos that I make and, uh I've heard a couple of stories say that as well. So it's, it's just kind of a funny thing, but uh, it is so true, isn't it? And, and I think that uh, if you think about, if you think about like the grand scheme of, okay, we were out, people like to refer fondly to like the Renaissance or, you know, medieval Italy that was trade and, you know, the new world in America, of course, there was a lot of violence and stuff that was happening there, but people like to refer fondly to that. But let's just assume that that was a very decentralized free trade world in you know, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s. Uh, it is a tendency and it's absolutely happened that even if you have very free, you know, the United States breaking away from Great Britain, uh, you know, 13 colonies, these United States, very decentralized themselves, limited federal government, which of course that has uh, centralized as well and they're fighting that today. but. Everywhere around the world, it's free banking has lost out. So this is why I'm not a defender of free banking like till the end. This is why I like Bitcoin is because even though the free banking systems of the past were very decentralized, a lot of free trade, they, they grew economies. Adam Smith said it was fantastic that we had this free fractional reserve banking system where we could, uh, you know, uh, increase our economy well outside the uh the, the the scope that the UK uh, I should say the UK Great Britain the you know England did to the south of them uh, you know 200, 200 plus years ago they they were able to do that in a very free decentralized way using you know using leverage using all of your uh, financial tools but at the end of the day it comes down to look five, four currencies it's unbelievable that make up eighty plus percent of the pie five currencies. And we gotta we gotta have a solution to that because it it is it does seem to be an undeniable tenet of human nature that we're going to centralize. Even if you have the most talk about the most free societies two hundred years ago. I mean, now we got Trump and Biden. Like that's your choice. That's your centralized choice in the next you know next two years. It's it's just insane. So uh, it's the same message that you know you guys talk about a lot. I'm sure on your show, but. Uh, you got to have an alternative. You got to have an escape hatch to that. And I don't really follow the day to day, but yeah. Well, I was t talking to Danny about, I was listening to a Joe Rogan show with um, uh, Dave Smith this week. And I th it's well worth checking out. And I can timestamp it about one hour, 10 minutes is worth going into because I, I reached out to Stefan Levera and like uh, pushed it to, pushed it to him because Dave Smith is very critical of big government, big state, you know, the darker underside of the government. Uh, he gets into money, gets into theft. He talks about, um, you know, this uh, uh, Rich Men of North Richmond song that came out, which mm. to me is kind of like all these, there's a lot of these conversations now happening in the podcast world. And there's a lot of these conversations happening, say, in the, uh, uh, let's say, the up-and-coming presidential candidates, your RFKs, your Vivek Ravaswamis. Yeah, there's, there's, I think there's this kind of wider understanding now or, or growing wider understanding that something's wrong. <laughs> you know, something is severely wrong. And the only place it hasn't seemed to permeate is the actual elites into the mainstream media and the main presidential or political candidates. But he said the main issue here is because, yeah, Dave Smith is very good with this. He said, you know, you have to accept there will always be elites. Like, accept that. Every society will have elites. 
but it's important that the elites give us something back. But they're not giving us anything. Like there's nothing being given back now. You know, all people are going is they're going from crisis to crisis to crisis. You know, and and ever since the financial crisis of 2008, have had their money stolen from them. And he said, you know, he's essentially talking about. Uh, I think he's kind of identifying that like uh, rich men of North Richmond as almost like it's kind of like a revolution. And I think we're going to see an awful lot of this, whether it's people in the UK smashing down these ultra low emission zone cameras, you know, whether it's someone writing a song or it's a political candidate going on a podcast. Uh, there's like a groundswell that I feel that I haven't felt in the previous six years of doing this podcast. I felt Bitcoiners think about it, but I feel like the people outside of Bitcoin are having these conversations just without the same Bitcoin, but it's, ex yeah. it's almost exactly the same conversation. Yeah, I think you're right. And I'm not sure where that will lead, because if you look at COVID, I mean, there was still a groundswell there of uh, in certain countries that like we're kind of limiting our freedoms for some of these things. Uh, some of these lockdowns are a bit draconian and so on and so forth. Do you really need that regulation here, that this or that? But that took that took a lot of time to sort itself out. And, you know, you didn't really have a revolution. I mean, China kept themselves locked down for an extra what, at least a year? two years <laughs> total. I mean, after everybody else. So it takes time. And I, I've said this a lot, right? I mean, if you were a gold bug in uh, the 70s, you would have thought that like you'd made it, right? Because the gold standard ended, gold started to be freely traded again. And by 1980, gold was 850 bucks an ounce for about two seconds on the world markets. So you would have think you're a genius. Like you would have thought it's, it's just game on for the gold standard and returning to sovereignty. But it didn't. I mean, they pushed they pushed on whole new amounts of leverage around the system. Uh, you know, interest rates went from basically twenty percent to where they are now at zero percent. Now they're trying to, you know, stem some of this just undeniable monetary and price inflation that they've created. But I do not know when that groundswell uh, pops or what's the word, right? I, I don't know when it explodes to a real revolution. I'm not saying I even necessarily would want that. But I certainly agree that uh, you know we're not getting anything for what what they're giving us, and something probably needs to change. So it would certainly be nice if it was more of a calm <laughs> change of things. But yeah, it doesn't seem like history really uh, works that way. Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm a little bit more optimistic. I, I and I but I think like, the reason I'm optimistic is I think we are. Yeah, I've been critical of Elon Musk, but one of the things he is doing well is he is champion. Uh, more independent media voices, yeah, you know, which is which is moving the Overton window. He's doing that through his platform. Yeah. And for what it, I, don't, I don't even care what his incentives are, he is doing that. Yeah. You know, it's Trump going on Tucker on X rather than joining the presidential debate on mainstream media. You know, that's a that's a strong signal. And I think if we can, I, for me, the 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 most important point is just just to destroy all credibility. I mean, they'll do it themselves of the mainstream media. Just get rid of that. Because yeah. I think that is what is polluting the minds of so many people. Yeah, I agree with you. That's a, that's a positive change. And uh, we, we, gotta, we gotta keep moving in that direction. Another yeah. thing, back to the monetary stuff, which is, which is interesting, is the banking. I've noticed in the UK over the last couple of months has really been a... Uh, hubbub about, you know, closing accounts. I saw you had Nigel Farage on. Yeah. Uh, what did he say? Four million accounts were closed? No, I thought it was, was that his estimate? Four it was million? a million, wasn't it, Danny? Yeah, I think it was a million. Okay. Yeah. I don't uh, know if still that's- Still a big number. Yeah, I don't even know if that's accounts or account holders because I've had uh, one, two, three, f essentially five accounts closed on me from three different banks over the last, you know, what, three, four years? Yeah. I've had the same. Uh, I've actually had banks. And that's a combination because I'm a US citizen and a Bitcoiner. But uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's definitely not just a UK thing. And I'm interested to see how that will change. I mean, if it doesn't change, we still have Bitcoin, so it's great. It's, and it's not great, but it's fine. But yeah, the, the problem is, again, it's not the free banking system. It's not banks working with individuals around the world. It's just draconian legislation. And are oh, they no. able to change it, roll it back? I'm not sure. I'm totally with you on that. Again, just as a business operator, um, 
I you know have a bit accounts for all of my businesses. Uh, and there's a couple of things that I could like highlight. One is the difficulty of opening a bank account. Like it is hard. The mm. amount of documentation you have to send is is actually insane. You know, back and forth yeah. to my account, and I need this, I need that, blah blah blah. But also, once you've got the bank account open, the amount of information you have to supply to transact. Now, there's certain things like sending money from person to person. You have to put their name and their account uh, details in, and then it will tell you if it's a match, which in itself you think, oh, that's cool. It stops me making a mistake. But really, it's like, oh, they know the exact detail from person to person, from bank to bank. So the banks are sharing that information. But on the business side of things is when I've gotten an invoice paid, like you might have an invoice that's tens of thousands of pounds. I have to sometimes send the contract. The the bank is saying to me, I want a copy of the invoice, I want a copy of the contract. So they want to see the contract I've got with the company. And it's like, hold on a second. Why is the bank being the person that is uh, reviewing the contract to see if this is a legal relationship? Yeah. It's a bigger discussion, but I do <laughs> yeah, think there has to be a no. I mean, I, I have to. I have to believe that Bitcoin will play a role in this sort of escape as well, because it's just getting so insane. You know, it's uh, it, it's it's the same. You know, you're talking about tax evasion or terrorism or whatever you're talking about. I mean, it's the good people that are suffering. It's the people. You know, the bad people are never going to comply with you anyway. They're not going to do your instructions, your rules anyway. The bad people will not stay on the phone with you for two hours, see if you can send this stupid, you know, thousand pound payment. The bad people will not be the ones doing that. So you're not accomplishing anything. And that's that's what has to change. And I, I do think that if Bitcoin, uh, well, I do think that Bitcoin will, will help to change that eventually. It already does. Look. Yeah. Uh, I can send an invoice to one of my sponsors, right? And they can go to pay, and then the bank can send me an uh, email saying to put this transaction through, I need a copy of the invoice, the contract, and we have to go through this hullabalah, and it takes a few days, or I send them a Bitcoin address and I get paid. Mm. And that, that's happened. that happens already. You know, it makes much more sense. Yeah, the question is when, like you said, the non-Bitcoiners get into that. When are the non-Bitcoiners yeah. going to start doing that? Well, we, you you just need a more stable Bitcoin. They're just they're not going to do it because I can't then hold it all in Bitcoin because if the Bitcoin price of Bitcoin drops ten percent because something happens with Binance or whatever, you know that affects the cash flow of the business. So, you know, yeah, Bitcoin solves one bit but not the other. You either need like more stable Bitcoin or more draconian rules. Like either way, it's going to make mm. people use Bitcoin. So, like for example, here in Australia, Combank, which is probably the biggest bank in Australia, have limited like payments if you want to try and buy Bitcoin in exchange or whatever. But they're also trying to implement uh, an idea where you have like a carbon footprint for every transaction that you make. So if you buy a flight, it's obviously like a high carbon transaction or whatever. And as soon as they start trying to stop you from doing like buying meat or buying a flight to go and see your family, then you'll see people change. So I think like the draconian rules can also force people to Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, it's a great point. Totally agree. Better media, better, better, better political leaders. Then just break it down. Honestly, I've yeah, I've, I've gone back and forth on libertarianism for four, five, maybe six years. And Stefan Levera, you know, God bless him, he is uh, stuck with me. I, he must constantly think, "Fucking hell, Pete, how many times do I have to tell you this?" And I keep coming back and go, "Yeah, but what about this scenario? But what about that scenario?" And honestly, <laughs> for six years I've done it, and slowly but surely I become a little bit more libertarian. A little bit. I was literally doing it the other day to him, but Dave Smith. In that conversation with uh, Joe Rogan, I'm going to say it again, it's one from about one hour ten in. Uh, he's got me. He's he's got me to the point. I'm like, right, I'm going to read everything that Ron Paul's ever written. I'm going to watch every Ron Paul speech. You know, I need to understand this because I just I I yeah you know, I say we need better political leaders. There's no one to fucking vote for in the UK. Who am I going to vote for? Rishi Sunak? <laughs> no. Okay. Keir Starmer? No. So I need an alternative. And, and, and so that's what I think we need. We need alternatives, better alternatives. <clears throat> well, I agree with you there. Uh, I have a little bit of pushback too, because I, I love Austrianism. I love uh, libertarianism. I love a lot of the theory, but still, and when it comes to the practicality, people's lives, we don't have to go into this whole thing, but you know, the Ukraine war, you know where I stand on that, being here in Eastern Europe. 
Yep. Uh, I disagree with, obviously, a lot of libertarians. Wh- whether it's the whole body politic of libertarians, I'm not sure. But it just comes down to me. And, and again, this is just a comment. I don't want to, I'm not saying we have to pull this thread. We have done this on prior episodes. But, you know, the U.S., actually, I have a chart of it. I was going to show you. This is U.S. federal debt all the way back to the entirety. Uh, if you look at the beginning here, 70 billion bucks. And they actually put it down to zero with Andrew Jackson, who was also not very good at the Indians. But again, you know, uh, libertarians kind of ignore some of this gray area. I don't. I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's a bad gray area. But you have here 70 billion, uh, 80 billion dollars of federal debt the United States had at their revolutionary times. I think a naive libertarian view is that, oh, we're just like this sovereign nation, you know, one people under God or one sovereign people with 13 individual states under God. We did it all ourselves. We, uh, we're so unique. You know, we're, we're, we're this sort of, yeah, the empire is really bad now and we need to bring it back, but we're a unique people, founding fathers. These people that, uh, that uh, you know, fought their way out of British colonialism had help from the French, the Dutch, and the Spanish. And when they finished, they had, they had debt owed to the French, the Dutch, and the Spanish. More French soldiers died during Yorktown. There were more French ships in Yorktown. Uh, these are just facts that, look, if you want to, this is why I'm so pro on helping Ukraine. You need to help every nation when they're fighting for freedom. Now, I'm not saying like explode federal deficits and understand, you know, for, forget all the principles. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that it is, it is so not black and white when it comes to some of these issues. And I do fear that, unfortunately, Dave Smith is that way when it comes to the Ukraine war. Uh, I don't fear. Yeah. I know that he is that way. But like, I mean, it's just, it's just not black and white like that. The, the United States is not some divine entity. Uh, it, they had help from other nations in their independence. And now they're buddies with the UK anyway. So what do you know about, what do you say about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, but I like I can I can agree with you on that point and disagree with Dave Smith and uh, and I you know agree that yeah. you should help Ukraine and recognize they've been invaded what twice now in the last 8 years and you know have had large parts of uh, their land stolen from them and you know uh, I, I This is I, where all this is where all the listeners drop off. Yeah, they're like <laughs> Buck, you've gone back into Ukraine, Russia again. No, no. Look, I can say I can agree, I can disagree with Dave on that, but just agree with him on um, like the general principles of these. I, I, th- I mean, he was saying the the U.S. Uh, government is the largest institution the world has ever known. Is this? It's the new Russian. Sure, Empire. absolutely but, the largest uh, collector as well of revenue. Absolutely, yeah, and spender. <laughs> And spender, largest overspender. But yeah. but it takes me back to yeah. my very, very first interview with Eric Voorhees. God knows what uh, episode number this. Danny probably knows. Uh, I, no, actually, it's my second interview with Eric Voorhees. We, we sat down in uh, uh, Denver, Colorado, and I talked to him because I was always like, yeah, you libertarians sound great, but like, like really? Like, ha- you're going to have a big red button, switch all this off? How's that going to work? He said, no. I don't want that. He said, the government grows every year. He said, how about we just shrink? Just 1%. Just Let's just get smaller. And I think it's that, like, this is where I've gone back and forth with Stefan, and I think he struggles with me and I struggle with him because I, I kind of want, uh, you know, put another thing in there. Um, Nick Carter said to me, he said, the problem with libertarianism is, is that it require for, for it to be successful, it requires the accumulation of power, which is antithetical to being libertarian. What I like the idea is that maybe a traditional party, and in the UK it would suit the conservatives, is that the consu- conservatives go back to conservative values and also become maybe a little bit libertarian in that they have a principal yeah, idea of smaller government, much smaller government, much less interference, much more free markets, much less bureaucracy. Just focus on that because that's something you can get behind. It's like a tangible difference, you know, with it, with, that, that you could get behind and vote for and say, okay, so what, you're going you're gonna to make government smaller, you're going to interfere with my business less, I'm going to pay less tax, I can vote for that. I'm all for it, Peter. I'm all for it. But Peter, look, at, look at this. This is, again, 200 and, uh, you know, 250, 60 years. 50 years of, uh, of federal debt right here, okay? Um, 
let's just zoom in to this uh, latter part of uh, the 20th century. Let's even take out the central bank stuff. This is just the debt. There was a big deal in the United States when Bill Clinton balanced the budget in the 90s. He did it for a couple of years at the end of the 90s. It was a big deal. He, he wrote it all the way through the end of this term. Democrats wrote it. Unfortunately, it didn't help. Not unfortunately, I should say. It, unfortunately for Al Gore, it didn't help him uh, win. But uh, it's just a big deal. They, they balance Congress, you know, divided Congress, balance budget, all that stuff. And he and he's still, still doesn't stop talking about it. This is his period right here of a balanced budget. All right, a balanced budget means there no, there's no net increase in the federal debt. Federal debt, no net increase. That's all a balanced budget means. It means you have not spent more than you've taken in with taxes. There's his balanced budget. <laughs> Since then, baby Bush, Iraq wars. Uh, GFC, Bush and, uh, you know, and Obama, Trump, Biden, all the rest, COVID. I, I agree with the statement that Eric made. I agree with it. But again, th I, this is why we're all, I think we are all practically looking at Bitcoin as a reasonable alternative, because no matter how much we talk about reasonable, uh, choice-driven alternative politicians getting in, I mean, it's just, it's the same and the same. And it's, it's, it's even worse. If you look at banana republics, if you look at Argentina, it's even worse, these figures. So, I mean, how do you think it's going to happen? Everything that you've just been saying, I agree with in principle. How do you think it's actually going to happen? Well, or if it's going to happen, it's going to be, it's going to be Bill Clinton for three years, hopefully without the sex scandals. Yeah. But I might, I, look, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I might be, um, being a little bit kind of utopian thinking, but yeah, me and Danny were talking No, I get about it. it. I'm just, I'm playing devil's advocate. You no, know no, no, I'm, it's good. I'm playing it's good. devil's advocate here. No, it's good because it because it also it just drives the kind of content I want to make. Is because like these scratch a niche. These make me think. It makes me think. Right, I think I want to call Natalie Smolensky and talk to her about this idea. Is because I like talking to her about that. I want to call Matthew Mazinski and talk about. But but Dave Smith said he like because Rogan said to him like how all right this is fine but how and he said look you there's a, there's an anecdote you can see and it's at the top of the mountain. He's like but we've got to figure out how to get to the top of the mountain. He said, like, I don't have all the answers. It's, it, I know it's going to be hard. But like, but he, he says it's there. But he says, we just need to crush all these agencies. And like, whatever, whatever. But he said, mm. we need to go back to the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. I mean, Danny, like, we had a conversation about this the other morning, right, Danny? Mm -hmm. Where I was like, well, the Constitution has these things called amendments. Can you not, can you not reestablish the Constitution? Could you not put in there new amendments, now understand where the Constitution failed or where government failed, you know, in terms of size and spend? And can you not have amend <clears throat> amendments in there, <clears throat> excuse me, to cover for something? Can you not have provisions in there for government expenditure as a percentage of, you know, receipts or something? I, I mean, look, I don't know. Maybe I'm being fucking naive here. And then additionally to that, you talk about Bitcoin as the alternative. Maybe a more realistic thing is we see it as an exit, and lots of it, that will grow over time. And as more people do, you know, we've seen DeSantis, we've seen Vivek Revaswamy, we've seen RFK all talk about Bitcoin now because they know it's a voting block. Maybe this will force the type of politician who has to think like that. So that's what the change might be. I don't know. I want to just. I want to just say it for the listener because I didn't. Uh, I didn't say it before. You're about five point six trillion dollars <laughs> in debt by the end of uh, Clinton's famous balanced budget, few years, and now thirty two point six trillion national debt uh, limit suspended indefinitely by Biden at the moment. Uh, I hear you. I've just thrown back some numbers. All right. <laughs> Fuck me. <laughs> Bye Bitcoin. Bye Bitcoin. Yeah. This is the beauty. This is the beauty. This is why, you know, the term, by the way, of what this is. Uh, let's go to this one. Let's go to the next one here. Uh, this is base money again. Okay. Same chart. I just taken away the differences between the countries. Same chart. The term of this money supply, besides being monetary base, base money, is called outside money. Okay. Gold and silver is also outside money. Why? Because it's outside the system. And that's the beauty about Bitcoin. That is, people might not understand it when they're talking about it all the time, making nice, you know, waxing and waning philosophically on your show. But Bitcoin is outside, literally from an economic term, it's outside the banking system. It's outside the financial system. So that's why we look at this money supply as well. Because even though you might think of the central bank as like sort of the core inside it, it's still 
it, it, it acts differently. It behaves differently. It's outside money. So that's why that's another reason. And, and that's why Bitcoin is comparable to it. It's outside money. And that's where there's a lot of good things, as we know, have been happening and will continue to happen. So anyway, it's just a little bit of point on outside money. So here we have outside money again. Uh, you can, you can uh, look at the trailing 12 uh, month change in this over the years. It's here. Okay, we don't have to analyze this. And again, this is try to talk to this, uh, talk around this for the listeners. You see big big jumps here actually during Y2K. The base money jumped thirty two percent year on year, uh, and then it the year after it didn't. It was like basically flat. Those were the most extremes that you had basically at all in the last fifty years until you get to the global. Why financial did it jump crisis. so much at Y2K? Yeah, that's a that's a famous thing actually because people were freaking out about the Y2K bug. And everything so they took cash out so central banks had to print much more cash literally physical cash huh. than they had before because people were freaking out about y2k you know there's these crazy libertarians like gary north he was a crazy one i like him actually i like some of his uh, writings but he's also kind of crazy he's he's passed away now he buried a tractor during y2k i mean maybe even more than a tractor i mean it was a like a like an excavator i mean big thing you know people do crazy things when they're really scared and uh Libertarians are kind of at the bleeding edge of that. But anyway, uh, so, so Y2K showed us real extreme swings, let's say. Can you see that? All right. Up to 30, on a percentage basis, 32% higher globally, globally. And then the year later, it's basically flat. <laughs> so if I say flat, that's no increase. If that's the low end, that's the low end extreme. That's something to keep in mind about is the money, do they ever decrease the money supply? Even though they say like they want to bring normalize things or bring things back in line, so on and so forth. Then of course, during the GFC, you got up again towards 40% year on year twice uh, in 2009 and 2011. And then COVID, COVID you got up again to 40% year on year. And the interesting thing is if I, if I were to smooth this out, okay, just put one line, one number where you can, I can give you guys one number. How much does the money supply, the base money supply increase year on year? It's this number, okay? And that number is 13% per year compounded. That means 1% that means per month. Because actually, this is compounded, it's even stronger. So 1% a month does not mean 12% a year. It actually is closer to 13. It's this power of compounding. We don't have to go through that whole lesson. But it's 1% per month. It's a massive increase. And yeah, it can be way above, way below. It's never negative. It's never Except, interestingly, uh, the start of this year, they really tried to pull it back a lot. Uh, you know, just interesting, happened to be some banking crisis happened because That's of that. That's the first time on record that it's it, ever been negative. Yeah, the only time is like, is slightly, you see it's like a negative 0, 0.0 there in my, my charts there in December 2000, one uh, full year after Y2K, right? After December 1999. Other than that, it, it did go a little bit negative in 2019. Again, they had the big repo crisis. They had a lot of hiccups there where they started to print again. But just twice, other than Y2K, twice in the last 50 years, it's been negative for a couple months. So I think that is a very interesting thing to think about. When you think about you know, all of their speeches, all of their lectures, all of their just constant, constant, you know, just, just telling you, we are going to normalize, we're going to get things, you know, we're going to do the right thing. By and large, the base money supply increases 13% per year. And by the way, that's a doubling less than every six years. Can you track inflation to that? If inflation uh, is I have not done it yet. Phenomenon. Correct. And I, I agree with that statement. That's Milton Friedman's statement. I very much agree yeah. with it. Uh, you, I have not done the, like each country's, uh, this is something I will work on eventually. Um, but you got to start looking at the bank money, the broader money that's increasing. Then you got to look at prices. I'm actually not a big fan of prices. Uh, even though I like tracking all these money supplies, I'm not a big fan of prices because as John Williams, the famous economist from Shadow Stats has said, you know, he's written many reports on this. In his opinion, what they say price inflation is, is at least 50% understating. Or in other words, it's actual prices are at least double in his opinion. Uh, so if they're saying 2%, it means 4%, you know, that's, is actually happening. Can anybody prove this? I think, I, I think price inflation is a very rigged game personally. I know there's a lot of different metri metrices. I think it's very good that people try to get a handle on it, but I have not delved into it. 
But of course you can. I mean, of course you can, right? I mean, there's no, uh, it, like, I mean, I mean, intuitively, of course we can understand that price inflation is a result of this. But the key, the key to understand here of Bitcoin's 21 million coins and what that compares to is that like, again, 200 billion, remember I said I would square this, right? 200, 150 billion bucks in base money 50 years ago. Let's sort all that out, do all the calculations. What does it mean when we say we have 27 trillion today? Even if that's down 3 trillion from a couple of years ago, it's still 13% per year compounded. It's a massive number. That's a massive number. And that's what they do. I mean, that's just like, these are the hard facts. Unlike a price inflation number, this comes from the central bank balance sheet. Like, I can't get any more hard here than going to, you know, the Bitcoin blockchain and finding a number. This is, this is from the source. See, um, a couple of interesting points on inflation as well is, uh, I think it was Eric Weinstein, was it Eric Weinstein, Danny, where we were sat with, and he said, well, the thing about inflation is completely subjective as well it all comes down to what you spend money on and what your outgoings are so it can be completely yeah and to be uh, specific you mean price price inflation yeah yeah yes. the way inflation if yeah. like when you see a, a cpi number it's like fine you see that cpi number but like inflation to you might be very different depending on you know, what you're spending your money on what you know yada yada but um even more importantly there was a very good article written by ovic roy's free op talking about inflation. Danny, let's make sure we put that in the show notes. I shared yeah, that with Dylan LeClaire uh, recently online. Uh, I think it's such an important article, everyone should read it, because it's the compound effects that inflation have on the poor uh, uh, is, is well worth understanding. And I saw it firsthand in Argentina. So for example, in Argentina, you have 150% ludicrous inflation. If you're middle upper class, you have access to all the tools to to avoid this. One, you can get paid in dollars, or you can easily transfer to dollars. You can get digital dollars, or even one thing you can get that uh, the the middle class can get that the poor can't get. They get credit cards, right? And they buy everything on their credit cards, and then they pay their bill at the end of the month, and it's seven percent cheaper or ten percent cheaper, whatever it is. So there's all these tools that you know the wealthier have access to, which compounds the problem for the poorest. Absolutely. Absolutely agree with that. And so inflation is bad, but really it, it is a tool that, uh, that is much more corrosive to the poorest in society. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see even, I can show you that in, in right. picture terms here. This is one more. All right. So this is uh, still on base money, but now we're only looking at that physical cash, CBPC, central bank physical currency. Remember I told you that was a third of the total, uh, roughly. It's $9 trillion. It's $9 trillion. Here's... Global population. 50 years ago, we were about 3.6 billion people on the planet. Now, eight. The UN it says over eight, but World Bank doesn't quite yet. So, eight billion. Okay. That's a doubling every uh, 50 years, which in percentage terms is one and a half percent. Okay. There's so that percentage on the right hand axis there, one and a half percent. Now, let's look at World CBPC. This is Basically, very, it's a subset of what I just showed you in the prior charts. Okay, This is central bank money that we know and understand in our wallets, right? Or in safes or under mattresses or in grocery store tills. Uh, inflating away <laughs> physically under the printing press. Uh, dollars, euros, yen, everything. Okay, $9 trillion, $9 trillion equivalent. All right. And notice here in COVID, we all like we're trying to get digital. Everybody said... What was the narrative? CBDC, we got to do digital. Literally, physical money is dirty. You're going to get viruses from physical money. What was the reality? What were they saying versus what were they doing? The reality was they printed $2 trillion more <laughs> equivalent in, uh, in COVID times. Globally, it's a global figure. The US dollar actually is about 2 trillion of this. 2.2, 2. 2, I think. 2.2 2 some trillion is the dollar. But euros, yen, yuan, all the other. So actually physical cash increases too. And the growth rate of physical cash now, let me show that, 10.5%. It's actually not as high as the 13% as the I showed you before because the reserves are like, I don't know, 14, 15%. <laughs> so physical cash is less than the, the base money. But what's the difference of 10.5 divided by 1.5? 7x. So here we can do a very simple calculation to under, understand that physical cash, the supply of money 
in the, in the world that most people use, mo- you know, talking about billions of people, the poorest of the poor use that mostly when they can't get bank accounts, uh, physical cash grows seven times faster than people on the planet, the demand. That to me, you cannot be more like, I would like to know what some Harvard economist says of this. How, how does this not cause price inflation? All right, the demand, the people grow at 1.5% per year. That rate is slowing, by the way. It was like maybe 2%. You know, if we showed this line 40 years ago, it'd be 2%. Now it's only 1.5%. That rate's slowing. Physical cash is also slowing, but not as much. Seven times faster. Physical cash grows seven times faster than we do as people. So I think that's a good one to illustrate the dangers of uh, central bank money. Is there a chart that accounts for purchasing power of that money? Yeah, again, I haven't got to it, Peter. I mean, you're you're talking price inflation, purchasing power. I yeah, yeah. I don't. I, I try to stick with. I try to stick with the stocks. You know what okay. I mean? I try to stick with the the simple things that most people, uh, even if they can't understand it, they should understand it. And it's if they don't uh, know where it is, I'll find it because it's reported. I just think that there's a lot of ambiguity with the, that purchasing power. I could right. I could run numbers. We could talk about it, but I I just I don't do it. So so. That's my little uh, high horse of that. M- maybe I will in the future. I just haven't, haven't decided. So there you go. Seven times faster. Uh, cash versus people. Let's not go too long on this, but this is... Uh, I showed this last April, and now it's just updated through June. Still growing. Okay, these are all the various money supplies. Uh, there's a lot on this chart. But again, lower left-hand corner, very small. Upper, upper right-hand corner, very big. Uh, the U.S. money supply is of roughly thirty-eight and a half trillion dollars at the moment, and you know, fifty years ago, three hundred billion. So massive, massive increase. Uh, again, this is all money. Okay, so we have the central bank money I just showed you is in the dark. Uh, it is in the dark pictures here. I don't know if I want to go through all the different uh, layers of the money supply here, but I just wanted to show you, even if you're talking about central bank money, which is in blue, okay, versus bank money, all right, or inside money, it's called, you know, money in NatWest accounts, uh, Chase accounts, Bank of America accounts, wherever you are in the world, that is in the green, okay? Those demand deposits that you think about a lot are in the darkest green, it's this one I'm highlighting the darkest green demand deposits. Mm. But then you got other things. You got like time deposits, money market funds, repurchase agreements, lots of other money supplies. Uh, Those are in the lighter greens. They're all growing as well. So again, they're talking about normalizing. They're talking about shrinking the money supply, raising interest rates. It's still quite high, even if there's like a slight, slight dip over the last couple of months. Uh, Let's say maybe $500 billion worth of a dip. It's still massive. So that's just the point there with this one. We did we did some deep dives on repos in the last show. I, w- I can even I can even guide the listener for that one if they want to go back. I thought it was it was uh, hopefully helpful. D- Danny Danny will explain the uh, repo right. I, I could see you smiling, and I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I can absolutely not explain that. Danny, tell, t- tell <laughs> Matthew what, t- tell Matthew what we talked about pre-show. That we always ask you the same questions and we still don't know the answer. <laughs> this is what I said before. Peter, you said you were going to go through and, and re-listen. No, it's good. It's good, guys. This is, this is great. I, I think we need to keep refreshing for, for everybody. We must have had Lynn Alden explain to us the reverse repo or overnight repo or fucking Fed repo rates. Yeah. Uh, honestly, 10 to 20 times. I still can't tell you. All I know all right, here is, it is that like when it's go like when it's high, it's not a good thing. That's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> Repurchase agreements are treasury securities that trade like cash. That's all you gotta think about. They're treasury securities that trade like cash. You got that, Danny? They're leveraged they're leveraged up. There's a there's a loan attached to them, there's an interest rate attached to them. They add to leverage in the system, but at the end of the day, you're trading around treasury securities and they're going on different entities' balance sheets and it's going to help them make trades or lever up or go short or go long. They're treasury securities that trade like cash, unlike a treasury bond that just sits in an account and collects interest. So it's a portion. 
I'd say repos are probably, actually, I think I have the number, four trillion. Uh, four trillion outside of the Fed, uh, inside the Fed, 2.6 trillion. So like six, six, seven trillion dollars are repurchase agreements. That means like actively traded, tre- that means actively traded treasury securities, six, seven trillion dollars. And as we saw in the national debt, treasury securities are 32 trillion. It's actually not the total of that. It's not all treasury securities. There's some agency, but regardless, six, let's say six, seven trillion are repos versus 32 trillion is the total debt. And there's even more US debt, which is outside of this number, which includes social security, Medicare, Medicaid, the untouchables. That's even outside of this number. But as you can see, it's a lot of numbers. It's pretty crazy. But uh, roughly, just think of repos as an entity is trying to get something done. They're trading the treasury security around like cash and using it in leverage, leverage operations. So they're borrowing it for collateral. That's one reason, it's not the only reason. Okay. But okay. yes. Yeah. Okay. So that so point is, this is a big money supply. This is US only. Remember, here we are at the globe. Just dear viewer, if you're looking at that, that 30 trillion base money here. Now, if we go back to the US, you're only seeing base money of uh, of bank reserves, 3.2 plus M0. Uh, 2.2, right? You're getting your your 5.5 roughly of uh, US base money, 5.5 trillion. So there you can see the differences. Uh, but but then you, you know this just shows you how big the money supply can get, can lever up uh, based on this base money. And Bitcoin is not comparable to this, by the way. One more point to make to this to this chart. What's in green is a Coinbase account, a Kraken account, a Gemini account. They are institutions, fiduciaries that are managing your stuff. So even if you have Bitcoin and you log into the account, you see on your screen, I have 0.1 Bitcoin right there. You see it on your computer screen. In reality, as we know, not your keys, not your coins. You don't have the Bitcoin. The institution has the Bitcoin for you. And in return, they have a claim to you and, in, and, and they're going to lever up that claim. They're going to make money. They're going to they're gonna invest. They're going to maybe run, you know, liquidity spreads, all these sorts of things. They're going to short long. So this is just the, the way that the economy levers up. I'm not saying I agree with it. Uh, I certainly don't agree with the centralized nature of it. But uh, that's to understand. This is why Bitcoin does not compare to a bank account. I know people like to say and run crazy numbers, 100 trillion or whatever of Bitcoin is going to be there. This is why I stick to the 30 trillion of base money to understand. It's because at the end of the day, we're still going to have institutions. We're still going to have people that are going to manage your money or manage other things. I'm not saying it needs to be that way or I want it to be that way. I'm just saying fiduciaries are in the system. And in the United States' case, in the United States' case, uh, the U.S. base money is, say, roughly five. It's actually closer to eight trillion if you look at all the Fed liabilities. But that's a whole other thing. There's a reverse repo agreement <laughs> that the Fed holds, which we don't want to talk about. <laughs> But they're saying there's eight trillion of central bank money in the United States. Okay, eight trillion, which includes a reverse repo facility, five point five of monetary base. Eight trillion of the United States central bank money. Uh, thirty eight trillion total money. Subtract eight from that, so thirty trillion of bank money. So there's your ratio. That's how it works in the United States. Basically, roughly thirty trillion in banking liabilities that just banks have with their customers of any sort, whether it's money market fund, time deposit, savings deposit, demand deposit. And the central bank themselves have about a liability of 8 trillion. So that's the ratio, that's the split. That's just what you need to think about. But Bitcoin is only comparable to the central bank. All right, let's just do some fun ones, maybe to finish it here, fellas. Uh, This is Bitcoin price. I like to do some trend lines as well. This looks a little bit daunting. Again, dear, uh, dear, Listener, we have some trend lines here. We have some uh, percentile curves. You can find this stuff on my YouTube channel, by the way, if you're curious to learn more. But uh, this is the Bitcoin price chart everybody knows and loves uh, as of maybe a day or two ago. And I have a trend line here. So unlike some other trend lines who go off of different things like Bitcoin's uh, money supply and uh, tend to try to predict things here, this thing will just just go over time. Okay. There's basic percentile or there's basic uh, trend lines you can do. You can do a linear trend line, logarithmic, uh, exponential or power Four basic trend lines. This is a power trend line. It's the best fitting for Bitcoin. 95% R squared. If I zoom in here, 
we can see that the trend line itself, it looks like it fits pretty well, right? There's a black line that just runs through the price and we can extend it out. It looks like it fits pretty well, but the price right now is under the trend line, okay? And then we have these bands, which are also a part of the analysis. What's in between the blue bands is basically where the price will hit two thirds of the time. It's a one standard deviation move. What's within the red is 95% of the time, two standard deviation move. So anytime the price is gonna be at the extreme of these bands, it's kind of an interesting event, okay? So let's just zoom in, let's, let's talk about what happened last year, FTX bankruptcy. Apparently they didn't have any Bitcoin as opposed to empty Gox or uh, Bitfinex, which I have earlier in the charts, they actually had Bitcoin. <laughs> anyway, uh, FTX or, or uh, Bitcoin price during the FTX bankruptcy actually dipped below one standard deviation move, okay? So the price was about, uh, the, the actual uh, trend line was about 40 grand at the time, $40,000. The price was only $16,000 and a one standard deviation down move was 20,000. So we were even below, we got below that here. You see that, the blue, let me take off the top so you know exactly what I'm talking about. See these down, standard deviation, one and two standard deviation down. So we yeah. hit one standard deviation down, and then we started to bump along two standard deviation, interestingly, according to this trend line. Uh, at the end of last year, into the start of this year, that we bounced back above, got back up to uh, the price was, you know, 30,000 or so for many, many months. It's down below now to 26,000. So we, we're below now the one standard deviation move, but we're not below the two. So it's just a guide. I'm not a trader but I just like drawing some of these trend lines. This is a very, in my opinion, much more scientific, interesting than some other people will hype up other types of trend lines. Uh, this, this is just a very simple, there's actually a, an old thread from Bitcoin talk. This user, Trollo Low Low was his name. He's very famous. He started doing these trend lines in Excel. I got my inspiration from there, but I put this on my website for many years and YouTube channel, but so we're, we're well below trend is an interesting thing, uh, but we're not, we're not at where we were at the end of last year, which was a very rare error actually. Out, what was happening last year was a 95% percentile move. So 95% of the observations had not occurred at those extremes at the end of last mm. year. But now we're, we're still at kind of rare. We're out of a two thirds move with this little dip down. So I think that's something to think about. Can you go forward and show us where we will be April uh 24 like the absolutely i'm just saying that's about, that's about the halving right yep that's, that's absolutely right 70 grand for the listeners where yeah uh, it predicts out to about 70 72 73 thousand uh is the trend line and then what is it like the, the last two peak cycles have been like what may 17 march 21 so december 17 and What's that peak there? Uh, you mean the price peaks or the yeah, that, that one peaks? That, yeah, that, the that one there. Yeah, December, December 17 and March and 20, 21. 20, 20 yeah, there was a double top actually, March and November. Yeah, because so like those, that, now we can look at the, go ahead. I was just thinking there's that rational root chart, which is like the, the spiral chart where, you know, those peaks and troughs correlate really well. And so I'm just like wondering, it's, 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 it's like, isn't it like every four years minus like three months or something? Uh, could be. I don't know the exact uh, cadency there, but the point of these percentiles, which I like, is you can see that they're rare events, right? I mean, it's the, the two percentile move, or two, excuse me, two standard deviation move, which means 95% of the time it doesn't happen. Okay, it's a five percentile event. Uh, they only happen way back here in, you know, 2013. 2017, kissed it, and then that didn't even occur based on this trend line. That didn't even occur in 2021. Those were only like 1% or uh, one standard deviation moves then. So very rare. Do you think there's any argument the reason it happened in 21 is because of the amount of leverage in the system, the amount of uh, broken, uh, uh, like, look, look, so we had like BlockFi, we had Three Arrows, we had the Grayscale Trust, we had Terra Luna. There was just so much selling power. And FTX. Because so much of this was, yeah, and FTX, because there was, you know, there was so much uh, fuckery in the system that there was just so much selling power at a good time. 
like basically massive amount of Bitcoin was being sold into a like a positive market. Yeah. I, I, your guess is as good as mine there. I definitely enjoy, you know, as we were talking before show, uh, Danny, like Checkmate and Glassnode, the research they, those guys do. Uh, you can see a lot of that, uh, that pressure. But I just think if you simply look at price, which is... Hold on. Just, I just want to see what they stole from us. Can you go to like uh, that, that uh, June peak in 21? What would have... Yeah, what would it, 20, what would have they stole 150K from us. So... Yeah, it was March, March, April. It was uh, 60K. And then uh, it went back down to 30, 40K in between the second top, which was in November, and it's back 67, 60. So we could, but we could have been one like 175K if we'd have had that like uh, uh, two deviation. Do you call it a two deviation up? Yep. Two deviations yeah. up would have been 175K. So I still Correct. would have won my bet against HODL, Correct. Danny, even on that. Ah, oh, like what's my bet with HODL for? Is it. By the it's a million dollar Bitcoin by 2027. Yes, where uh, let's check it out. You're not going to get there. If you, are you on that no, side? No, are I'm you taking it? Okay, then you, I think you're going to be all right. Well, of course it could be. Two, those are two standard moves. Actually, let's put this two step. Yeah, oh, I want to see the two standard the up, moves. Ups. Okay, so end 2027. The the curve, the trend line is 260k, 250, 260k. End 2027. One standard deviation up. 570,000, two standard up. <laughs> okay, that's your risk. Yeah. Uh, 1.7 <laughs> million. And by the way, I go out to 2030 and it's 600,000. It's just the, it's the regular curve. By the way, I'm, I'm happy to lose that bet. <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine. If Bitcoin hits uh, 1.7 million, I will lose that bet. Bev, Bev, <laughs> Bro, Bedford will get a new football stadium. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> This is yeah. such a so so. This is uh, can I put a nice way to look at it? I think D is there like a can uh, I get this online? This is all this is all local, but Danny, I can send you links to my YouTube uh, where I discuss this stuff. Um, cool. It, I, it, I want I, this chart local. As of right now, I got to do everything. Yeah, as of right now, it's all local. We could talk about it if I can try to get it on your computer, but it might take some programming. No, I th I think you need subscription. And I think someone needs to be able to subscribe and have this chart. And I think this <laughs> this chart here itself, like this is, it's a more it's rational a fun one. version. Of, well, it's it's better than Plan B's. It's better than the Rainbow. Like all those charts, I think this would be something that people would look at a lot. Yeah, I mean, because it actually is s scientific in some way. Yeah. What do you think, Daddy? I think people would just use this as their standard. Yeah, hundred percent. What stops well, you making this digital? Uh, th this one would be easier because most of the data is uh, is very easy to get, like you know, from someone like CoinMetrics or something. Uh, it'd be harder for the other ones, which is a lot of manual input. But uh, that's a long story. It's a long story. <laughs> Listeners we'll don't about, want to hear. We'll and I, I don't have an answer. I, I, I don't have an answer for it at the moment. You maybe every quarter you're going to be asking me that, but I don't have an answer at the moment. Dude, I think you're uh, leaving so much money on the table and not giving people subscriptions to this. <laughs> Let's see about it. Let's see. So, so this is uh, this is all time trend line. One more interesting one I want to show you though is the difference, of course, as I didn't mention my by name, but you did. You know, other charts like stock to flow, so on and so forth. Those are just static, no demand taken into, and just to, you know, putting it on there, assuming that the price is going to match this, right? Like a Bitcoin is, uh, you know, declining emission rate, the inverse of that, so on and so forth. Uh, this is a very simple one variable model. Anybody can calculate it. Anybody can use it. It's, it's, it's standard statistics. But the reason that it works is because it moves with the price, right? Like if it's the price is below right now, you see the price has been below for the last two years, right? As we know, that has been pulling down all of the lines, but it pulls down the black lines. And as we go above it, once we do, it will pull it back up. But an interesting question is, would you like to see the progression of how those go? And I, I have that for you. I already have the, uh, the answer for you. So actually I didn't want to, uh, to click them on the start here. But uh, so here's the all time trend line again. What if we just looked at the crazy days, right? Like the start when Bitcoin was getting a price. I start this from Bitcoin Pizza Day, by the way. And there's some, you know, very early thin pricing data. But then you get, you know, once you get to like 2011, 2012, you're okay. Let's look at 2010's trend line. And how did that look? Okay. Quite different. 
20 trend, if you only use data from 2010 and then project out, you would get this. And this is massive. Okay. We're already at $5 million Bitcoin in 2017. We'd be billionaires. Today, we, we would be at $1.2 billion. You're not reading this wrong. $1.2 billion Bitcoin. That's a 2010 trend line. Take it out to 2030. $128 billion. <laughs> a Bitcoin. So it's a great, it's a, yeah, you got to love that trend line. That's the 20, that's the 2010 trend line. Okay. But as th it's, this is the better way to look at it. As time goes on, we adjust our models and things change. Let's go all the way up to 2016. Now, this is very interesting. I don't have 2011, 2012, whatever. That 2011 is also quite extreme. It's not, th but let me just tell you, 2010 is the highest. Okay. There's nothing higher than 2010. Okay, so it's, it's the best one. But as you add more years, it comes down. So let's go to 2016 now. And you have the all-time trend in black. Let's put 2016 on. Did you see it? Yeah, it matches. Did you see where it fell? Yeah. It's almost the same. Let's zoom in now. We got to take out 2010, I think, probably. to. It's almost the same as the current. All right? Yeah. And now as we're zoomed in, I'm going to add more and tell me what you think of this. 2017. 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022. Yeah, so basically you have so, enough data to be statistically significant. Not even that. It's just that yeah, that, that is, I think, would be the case even many years ago. Uh, you know, it's, it definitely is something that, that works and Bitcoin has followed it. But yes, the trend line goes down, but it's actually not even at the lowest. 2016 was the lowest trend line we've ever posted. 2020 was also quite low. Uh, we just pulled below that all time. You see the 2020 trend line, it's 57,813 should be the price. Whereas our all time is 56,000. So we just, in the last couple of months, pulled below the 2020. So, but still, we're not at the lowest. That's the 2016 trend line. We're very close. 2016 trend line projects 55,600. We're at 56,700. Maybe we'll post a new all time low trend line this year. But the point is, these things bounce around. And really, in the last seven years, uh, you know, we haven't, we haven't deviated far from that at all. It's, it's incredibly strong, in my opinion. So if you go back to this one, it starts to make sense, right? If you can understand like how yeah. sort of stable that black line is. And then here, you can literally see it how it worked out. Like they all just start, start stacking on top of each other. So I think that's a very good sign for Bitcoin. You know, yes, we can have rough days. We can have two Sigma down months and weeks where we go way, way below the current trend. And we're still below the current trend on a one Sigma down move. But this is the perspective. This is why I like this, you know, the big picture stuff. This is, this is I think, the perspective that uh, viewers and listeners should take. Man, you got to get this digital. I'm telling you, Matthew, if this is out there and people can access it, <laughs> they'll be sharing it constantly. You'll have a million followers on Twitter. You'll be, you'll be doing deals for, I don't know, brain pills and mattresses, and you'll be rich and famous. We'll be talking about Plan M. Maybe, maybe I can. Uh, maybe there's a marketing fellow that can help me out. It. I will see. I, we'll see. I know. I know a thing or two about marketing. <laughs> Danny, help me out here. Come on. Especially if you just post that 2010 chart, then you'll be really famous. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's all po it's all posted already. But uh, yeah, the, getting on. I just started doing YouTube videos this year, and I can tell you it's grind. But uh, you know, it, it's all right. I, I'm. Yeah, it's the I'm sharing. Happy, I'm happy with everything that's happening. As soon as people yeah. can access a URL with this on, they're going to share it const constantly. It's going to have Paul Coppolis economics up there. And then you're going to have people subscribing. You're going to get paid for your work. I just like, or, or if you don't want to do it, I'll do it and I'll give you a cut. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll leave it open. I don't want to bore the listener with the details, but uh, all I could say is it's been a grind even getting all this stuff together in this sort of uh, animated way this year, but it's, it's available. I'm doing videos uh, a lot about this stuff. So definitely you can check it out. Pork Opolis Economics on YouTube or Crypto Voices podcast uh, on Spotify, you know, Apple Podcasts, everywhere else. We will put it all in the show notes. Danny, I haven't looked at my notes once. No, but it's been great. Matt, love this. Absolutely love this. This is amazing. Right. We will. Is there anything else you wanted to cover? No, fellas, it's always a pleasure. I enjoy speaking with you both uh, anytime. So thanks a lot for having me on.
in summary, everything is fucked. Buy Bitcoin and look at the charts. It will make sense. <laughs> Ma- Ma- Matthew picture. Maths is working. Big picture. Patience. Amazing. Well, listen, look, yeah, we'll pimp this out. We're going to get you to Bedford next year for our conference. You're going to present all this, hopefully, or something else. We definitely won't talk about the war. And, um, yeah, amazing. <laughs> I fucking love this stuff. Yeah. All right. Matthew, love you, man. Thank you. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks a lot, guys.